food is a time to come together with other people. Um, mm. We really cut people off in prison from that experience. And if we think about, you know, this weekend, oh, I had that terrible dinner on Saturday night, right? And it sort of stays with you all day, all weekend long, maybe even here into the week. In prison, that's every meal, three meals a day, month after month, year after year. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time, for a fresh podcast. Today we're meeting with uh, Alex Bukowski, who's the founder of Impact Justice, and George Carter, who's the founder of Scoot Strategy. Am I pronouncing that correctly, George? Scout. Scout. All right. I did say I did say that earlier on. I thought that can't (laughs) possibly be right. That's too easy. And it's Buzanski. (laughs) Buzanski. Okay, so Alex began his career as a prosecutor at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in 1987. And for four years, he handled homicides, serious domestic and other family violence and sex abuse cases. He moved on to found Impact Justice, which is a national innovation and research center based in Oakland, California and Washington, D.C. And it works to create a more humane and restorative system of justice in the United States. I should mention that we've emerged, uh, engaged with Impact Justice previously when we talked with Leslie Sobel and Roy Waterman about food in U.S. prisons last year. George Carter is the founder of Scout Strategy and is an ecosystem and food systems builder and ag technologist. He partners with Impact Justice to develop vertical farming. Hi to the two of you. It's good to be here. Hi, really pleased to meet both of you. Thanks for giving us your time. I wondered if we could start by hearing how the two of you came to be working together. Great to be here. As you know, uh, Impact Justice did our national report looking at the state of food in America's prisons called Eating Behind Bars. And Leslie Sobel, who you mentioned, was the lead author of that report. But that report was more than just a critique of the state of food in America's prisons, but also took a holistic look about what might the opportunity be to improve the state of food in America's prisons. And Impact Justice as an organization works on trying to build solutions. What are those actionable ideas that we can move forward to end mass incarceration and improve the outcome of the lives of people who are caught up in our current system? And in looking at food, we realized that there was an opportunity to think about the role of agriculture and the job opportunities for people leaving prison in the field of agriculture. There's a long history in the United States of excluding people of color from the opportunity of agriculture. We talk here in this country about 40 acres and a mule and what that meant with westward expansion uh, in the 20th century. That is a promise and an opportunity that was not made available to the black community. At the same time, we know that agriculture is really hard, right? Global warming has already made a risky business even riskier. It's not a, uh, an older person's sport. So if you've been incarcerated for 10, 20, 30 years, You need land, it takes money to acquire that land, and most of the uh, workable good land in this country is in the hands of a relatively few number of people, all predominantly white. So in thinking about what might be needed for the 21st century and beyond to address the food problems, we look to vertical farming, we look to controlled environmental agriculture. And as we started casting about uh, and thinking about who can we partner with this, because we're not food people, we're not agriculture people, we, uh, we introduced uh, George into Scout Strategies and quickly realized that this was not just an organization that had a, the technical knowledge to be able to carry this mission forward, but also uh, was part of the mission, shared our values and shared the mission that we have as an organization. And then the rest is, I, I don't want to say the rest is history, but I'll say the rest is the future. And we're really excited about what's to come next. So can, so can you tell us a bit about the project Growing Justice and what, what's happening with that? So Growing Justice is our effort to bring uh, containerized farming into a prison setting and into the community here in Oakland 
but, but particularly in the prison community, to bring containerized farming, to be able to train, in this case, women in a Southern California prison who are incarcerated for life and near life, to run that farm, to grow the leafy greens, to use those leafy greens to put them into the food stream of the prison, into the food plan that they have there, but also to give the women there a living wage to do that work, and for those who have the opportunity to be released, to provide a pathway into a career in vertical farming. We're also doing growing justice in Oakland uh, at our office building, where we'll be setting up containerized farms, and they're training formerly incarcerated men and women to run that farm, and it, setting them up for jobs in the vertical farm industry. And then taking all of these people, both from the prison setting and from Oakland, and working with some of the largest vertical farm uh, companies here in the United States to be able to give them jobs. So good paying, steady work, jobs that they can do, not in far rural, out of the way places, but frequently in urban or near urban settings, right? Close to family, close to relationships, close to just the world of life and activity. And if we can prove that it can work in a Southern California prison, it can work in a Northern Minnesota prison or it can move in a West Texas prison, whether it's the middle of the summer in August when nothing is growing or the middle of winter. But showing also the humanity of people in prison. Thank you. And can I ask a, a question that we're going to sound terribly ignorant, but I don't have any knowledge of agriculture really. What it, what is vertical farming? George? Yeah, so, so vertical farming in essence is growing crops uh, indoors uh, under normally under LED lighting um, in a vertical stacked orient, right? And so instead of growing horizontally and, and on uh, using soil and land, you're able to use space much more efficiently. Uh, and generally, you see indoor vertical farming tied to hydroponics. So that's growing plants in a nutrient water solution. Uh, but we also are now beginning to see the industry evolve into uh, also utilizing aquaponics, which is creating an entire ecosystem around fish waste uh, and using that for nutrients for product uh, and, and the crops. We're also beginning to see soil, uh, soil indoor vertical farms. And so this is one of the fastest growing industries, dare I say, you know, kind of across the world as we are watching climate change and, and our food system undergo a massive transformation, uh, knowing that we are going to have uh, 8 billion people to feed, 10 billion people to feed over the next 20, 30 years. How do we do that uh, with, with less resources, right? And that's really what is impending upon us. And vertical farming gives us a aspect and an ability to grow food uh, in that manner. Can I ask how it came about, that, that whole concept? I mean, hydroponics... What's, what's the history of vertical farming? How do, yeah, I mean, hydroponics has, has been around growing plants in water for years, but what has really enabled the, the, I guess you would say, growth of indoor vertical farming is the advent of LED lighting technology. Uh, and so it is, you know, an industry and a technology that is probably roughly 20 years old. It actually got its start in Japan and has, has really grown from there. And it's grown off the hills in the back of LED lighting the efficiency, uh, most traditional lighting sources create a lot of heat. Uh, therefore, they can't get incredibly cro close to the crop. Whereas with LED lighting, the crops can grow right up to the lighting. Um, and so it's it's been that combination of kind of the evolution of LED lighting in addition with hydroponics, uh, which again is, is using water to grow the plants and not soil. Um, so really with the combination of those two things, you've really seen the growth of the industry. And then I think when you overlay digital technologies as well, um, that has really also pushed the growth of, of this industry. Uh, so it's kind of a combination of things. Um, but then also the, the market forces, right? Like we are, we are having to figure out ways to use land more efficiently, knowing that most, uh, most of our populations now live in urban centers, but we have to rely on other parts of the world to bring in the food and realizing that those communities actually are not that resilient. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a host of a lot of different factors that I think are really driving, um, the prevalence of this industry. 
Yeah, you can see how it would. It could also potentially, I guess, be beneficial to northern hemisphere countries. You know, um, like Scandinavia, where they've got a limited amount of daylight during certain times of the year. Yeah, and and um, amounts of renewable energy as well, right? Because that's the one thing that can't be, you know. Um, left out of this conversation is that you're having to use electricity and energy to run these lights, right? And so we are also having to figure out ways to leverage renewable energy and battery technology to make these farms more efficient. Uh, because, you know, as you guys know, in Europe, there's an energy crisis right now and the cost of energy is exploding and making it hard for people to yep. live. And so if you're paying for that energy pan to, to grow plants, like that, that could cause some issues. And so, you know, we, we know indoor vertical farming is a solution to part of the food system of the future, but, you know, we're still constructing the systems around it to make it a truly sustainable and regenerative part of our food system. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. And I, obviously, I heard, um, Alex, you say that um, that people who are incarcerated are involved in, in the projects in terms of actually working in prisons, but how much... Are people with lived experience of prisons involved in the sort of planning, the strategic preparation around around this project? So uh, this project was really born out of the work we did with our report called Eating Behind Bars and conversations we've had both internally in the organization where we hire formerly incarcerated people and also people in other organizations um, who are formerly incarcerated and system impacted. And the major desire that we hear is that the quality of food in prison needs to be improved, right? That you're not getting a diversity of nutritious, tasty vegetables and fruits in prisons. And we can't address the fruit problem, but we can help with the leafy greens um, that are part of that daily diet. When we were down at CCWF, the women's prison in Southern California, George and his team were there and some of my colleagues were there we toured the facility and had an opportunity to meet with the Women's Advisory Board, which is comprised of uh, women from the prison who are incarcerated there. Uh, and it was, I think it was the head of that group and the two other senior members. And, uh, you know, I'm not a person who cries that often, but you just both wanted to cry when you hear about the sort of state of what they're experiencing every day around food, but more importantly about the sign of hope that they see for this project, right? Because again, it's both about like changing their diet and changing that opportunity, giving them work that's meaningful to them. Most programming in prison is really built around the needs of men. So you see a lot of shop programs, mechanical programs, things that aren't necessarily resonating in the same way in women's facilities. <clears throat> but also this is a way to be able to shed a spotlight on the very humanity of the people inside of prison. If food is love, if food is community, right? This week in the United States, we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving. If food is a time to come together with other people, um, mm. we really cut people off in prison from that experience. And if we think about, you know, this weekend, ah, I had that terrible dinner on Saturday night, right? And it sort of stays with you all day, all weekend long, maybe even here into the week. In prison, that's every meal, three meals a day, month after month, year after year. And so if you can break that up and provide something different for them and for the people who don't see them as human beings who are locked up, I think it becomes also a potent vehicle for reform because it opens up your mind to seeing people differently. Absolutely. I mean, well, sorry. And just one thing to add about that, uh, just that experience that, that Alex was talking about. I mean, it was probably a, a 30 minute interaction, but in my 15 year professional career, I will say that was probably one of the most profound moments or, you know, profound pieces of my career to to just witness. Right. I mean, we ask these women to come into a room. They have no idea what they're coming in for. They have no idea who these people are and to watch their body language and just their spirits change throughout the conversation as we began to talk about the purpose of this project and what we were bringing to this project was transformative. It was incredible. Like, again, it, it was just one of the, the most uh, kind of human experiences that I've ever experienced um, in that setting. And uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to, to mention that. So, I, you know, that kind of underscores the significance and the importance of this project uh, to those women and, and, and kind of the significance of it. Um, so 
Yeah. No, that's beautifully moving. And as David said, one of our favourite conversations, the the year that we interviewed uh, Leslie and Roy, was that conversation. There's something really hopeful and uplifting about it. And I think food's something that's very easy to take for granted when you're eating a decent meal most of the time. But actually, when you see what's served up in in prisons, you can appreciate the the value that becomes imbued within the food. Just um, thinking about the um, the involvement of people who are in prison in these things. I mean, I've spent many years working in a high secure prison in Britain, and we tried uh, for many years to get a herb bed in <laughs> just a, just a plain herb bed, and it took probably a couple of years of real pressure from one particular prison officer who did, made it his mission to get this herb bed. And there was this mistrust of people, a fear that they were going to plant things in the soil, you know, they'd secrete items in the soil. Uh, did you face these kind of barriers in terms of getting people who are in prison involved in the project? I think I mean, people underestimate how hard it is to launch any kind of project. And it's really great to hear that you tried to do an herb bed in uh, prison. Were you successful in the end, by the way? Yes, and, okay. and that weirdly, once that once that had happened, the next uh, it followed on very quickly after that. But uh, you know, and it and it grew. But it's as you say, it's very difficult to get change within an institution which is uncomfortable with anything different and sees risk everywhere. Um, I think um, it's weird, but people end up as scared of plants as they would be of triffids. Um, so it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's crazy here too. So yes, we have a number of obstacles as we're trying to advance this work. And some of those revolve around, I'll call it the security issues at the prison, right? They're very worried that this is going to lead to some sort of set of security violations. It is also true that we are facing a series of, this isn't what we've ever done before. How do we do this? And so there's a lack of familiarity with what we're doing. And then just the general sort of government bureaucracy that makes any type of capital project, anything, right, really difficult. If we were, you know, bringing in truckloads of money to hand out, I'm certain it would take us months to get through the red tape of how to give out that money. Food is no different. Um, but at the same time, the excitement of the women who are in the facility uh, and I think the general support of the higher ups in the Department of Corrections for this initiative are really helping both give kind of the motivation that people need to do this. And I think helping us to work through the red tape and impact justice as an organization. We work with people on the ground in communities. We work with system impacted people. We work in facilities, but we also work with government officials, with system leaders and others. And I think as a trusted broker of all of those relationships, we have a level of credibility, which is allowing us to move this project forward. Yeah, no, to echo that to Alex's point, I mean, Impact Justice has built an incredible team around this project to support it, right, at every different angle. And we all play a different role in advancing this project forward. But I mean, you know, hats off to, to Alex and the Impact Justice team for doing that. And I think the reality is doing things that have never been done before is incredibly hard. But to your point, Naomi, when, once you do them, right, the, the, they, it seems to, to change something fundamentally in the system. And that's what we're talking about doing here, right? We're, we're fundamentally talking about changing the way the food system works in one of the biggest privately owned and run organizations in this in this country and so that that's going to that's going to take moving some mountains to get it done but i think when you also have a team that is committed to the the shared vision and and largely what we're trying to do collectively then your your chances of success increase exponentially i think and so um that's another incredible piece and an important piece i think we have to talk about here mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, just to put it in, just to put it in perspective, in the United States, there's over 2 million people who are currently incarcerated in our prison system, right? In the state of California, the prison system, there are 32 prisons in the state of California. The California prison system is the largest single purchaser of fruits and vegetables in the state of California. So to make this project work, isn't some sort of boutique project that will meet the food needs of 30 people, right, living in a group congregate housing 
situation, but rather something that will impact thousands upon thousands of people if successful. And that is a really powerful incentive to work this pilot forward. That's really phenomenal. And surely as well, the, I mean, the economics of that must surely speak to, to the government. Yeah. Um, but in the same way that we were talking about how these kind of projects have the potential to change something in the system so that then the next project can happen, I think they also offer real, um, offer, they offer something to the incarcerated person, don't they? In that many of the people that we've spoken with who've previously been in prison have spoken about the importance of somebody believing in something in them offering them something that was hopeful or conveyed trust that something that saw the somebody who saw the best in them and it sounds like the kind of projects that you're running give people those chances you know it gives an opportunity it allows people to see the potential of the human being rather than just seeing them as the person not to be trusted i i think that's right i think that's what we aspire to great so George, as I understand it, you're the technical uh, wizard, and I find that I'm, I'm, I've, I've come into an area where I know virtually nothing. In fact, I know less than I thought I did at the beginning. So <laughs> I'm, I'm puzzled because I, I would have thought that LED lights don't produce or don't project enough energy to promote growth, but obviously they do. So. How much, how does this work and how can you, how much can you grow in a container? Yeah, it really depends on the crop, right? I mean, and so I think oftentimes we want very black and white answers with agriculture and food just because it's a system of production. But we, we, we got to remember that these plants, you know, they're, they're living organisms and they're going to do what they want. But what is up to us is to create the right conditions, right, that these plants can thrive in. So, you know, whether that's giving them the right amount of nutrients that they need. With LED lighting, it's also about tailoring the, the spectrum, right? So that's also an advancement in the technology that LED lighting gives us. It can, it can allow us to give these plants a much more broad spectrum that's closer to the sun than what just a broad kind of white light would do as well. Um, and so just with those little pieces, uh, that, that that allows us to, to to basically mimic the outdoors indoors, right? With uh, very very precise HVAC uh, systems that can create the type of optimal environment that a plant needs to live. It's all of those pieces uh, that allows you to and enables this industry to exist. Um, you know, and so again, these are things that have been being done for a long time. It's now just kind of putting it in in a package. Um, so. Do you make use of red lights as part of that? I'm just thinking that red light, we know that red light helps bodies heal and grow, doesn't it? It does, yeah, and, and different parts of the red light across the spectrum. So uh, when you look at far red light uh, in the lighting spectrum that, that is mimicked by the sun, that also really helps complete the entire cycle of, of photosynthesis. So again, it's about getting the plants everything that they need in order to do what they would naturally do in an outdoor setting. Uh, but again, really trying to give it everything that it needs to be able to function in a artificial environment, ultimately, right? That's, that's what we're doing. And so we're trying to get as close to the outdoors and nature as possible, which you're never gonna be able to do that, but that's what indoor farming is intending to do regardless of what the crop is. And, and going back, David, to your original question, so how much can you even grow in these containers? We're anticipating being able to grow anywhere between 500 to 1,000 pounds per week um, out of these containers. And so, but even that has a level of flexibility because it changes and adapts based on the type of crop that you're growing, when that crop needs to be harvested. So there's a lot of variability um, that, that still comes into play when you're growing indoors and you're controlling all those factors. But it's still, you know, there's still plants, it's still farming uh, and living organism organisms so um that's obviously quite quite a lot and does it operate on a seasonal basis you know because what i know from my garden when i used to grow vegetables you get spinach um actually spinach does tend to grow quite a lot but you'd grow a crop and then it would all be gone um so how's that going to work yeah so it's it's there's no seasonality to it right you can grow year round but you know 
what changes are the environmental factors in the way that the mechanical systems work. So, you know, your HVAC or air conditioner or heater is going to work much harder on a 115 degree day than it would work on a degree where it's or a day where it's 70 degrees. So it's much more about the way the mechanical systems are impacted uh, than it is actually what's going on inside the farm when you're going to consume peak amounts of energy uh, and different things like that. So it's having the technical understanding to be able to buffer against those things, right? Making sure that the containers have the right amount of insulation so that they're not gonna be affected by, uh, you know, sun that's pounding down on them and it's 115 degrees outside. Uh, it's making sure that you have the right HVAC system and air conditioning system to handle all of the heat loads um, that are gonna be coming off of the lights and, you know, plants grow and as they grow, they put humidity into the air. And so how do you also balance and manage all of those factors? And that's what all of those mechanical systems are for. Thus, it removes seasonality. So uh, is it, would it be right to say that these are a pilot projects, really? Yes. Yeah, great. So pilot clearly it must have been a very delicate negotiation to get these, this project uh, going within a, a prison. Um, you're, are you planning to extend it to other prisons? Is that an ongoing negotiation? Well, first, we hope to get one up and going, right? And so we're still in motion and progress around that. If successful, we anticipate that we'll expand to a men's facility, which is nearby the Southern California site. And then we'll see. Uh, Impact Justice is not a farming organization. We're not an agriculture organization. But we do hope that in demonstrating that this is a, more than viable, but this is a real way to think about food in prison and to think about the people in prison and think about jobs and job opportunity. We'd like to be able to do some scaling of this, but then who knows what happens, right? But job number one is to let's get this one up and going and CCWF and make it work. Great. So forgive me, this next question is a bit of a Twitter inspired question, um, but you both on your website, you write about the importance of forming relationships uh, with with uh, people, and you're clearly both leaders and innovators. How do you get other people to work with you? Is it all down to giving them money, or do you have to be firm and direct, like the CEO of Twitter? Well, I hate that analogy. That everything that I'd be like the CEO of Twitter. But what do you mean by people to work with? You mean the employees or partners on an organization or the government system people we work with? I guess the people you work with, yes. Well, the people we work with, my staff, we pay everybody on my staff, right? Whether you're formally incarcerated or not. And we have health insurance and a 401k and vacation and wellness time and paid off holidays and we, you know, a whole host of benefits. And uh, it's a community of people right, that you get to uh, work with, depending on what team or what project you're working on. Uh, we also partner with other nonprofits and other for-profits when appropriate to do the work. And if it's something substantive that requires us to pay them, right, either as a subcontractor or a grantee or whatever one might call that legal relationship, then we pay people. We pay individuals when appropriate for their time and their resources. And some of that time is for them to just tell us about their lived experience. Uh, and then we also work with people who volunteer their time, who give it pro bono. Um, sometimes those are more of the professional categories, lawyers and so forth. But people also want to volunteer and help out. Great. So you treat, you treat them well. Uh, I suppose is the answer to the question. You, as I we say, try. We yeah. try. We try. <laughs> every, every now and again, you see over here, we're exposed to the full blast of some American labor practice. And so it's always good to test out that uh, yeah. not everyone operates in the same way. Yeah. Can I just ask another question? One of the, uh, so one of the aims was about kind of like in, impacting on the justice system and trying to improve the quality of life for people inside prison. But you also spoke about trying to um, reveal the humanity of people in prison to people outside and get people to see them in a more compassionate way. Can you tell us something about that angle of the work? 
You know, I think one of the challenges that uh, criminal justice and prison reform, right, prison abolition has, uh, particularly in this country, is that prisons are too often placed in remote locations far away from n not just urban communities, but people's communities where their families and friends and loved ones are. And, uh, and even though the majority of men and women who are incarcerated in prison are parents, and almost all of them have relationships with somebody somewhere, we really don't do a good job of providing access to those relationships and ways for people to continue to have supportive relationships. And if you're a kid, your dad doesn't stop being your dad because he goes to prison, or your mm -hmm. mom stops being a mom because they go to prison. But we, that's, but we do that to people. We cut them off. On top of that, we uh, limit the amount of outside information they can have. We limit their ability to get an education or to improve themselves, right, to get a job skill or job training, right, to get credentialed in something. And we cut them off from some of the most basic and fundamental requirements of being a human being, food is one of them. And I don't think people understand, I know people don't understand what goes on inside of prison and how we really treat people inside of prison. And so the food conversation is a, an avenue to opening up, not just as I said, how we treat people, but how we see people when people understand what goes on. I mean, in part, this, the whole field of food in prison at Impact Justice and this sort of movement that we have started around food in prison really came from a, a funders grantee event that I was at a number of years ago and another organization that does really great work trying to improve the quality of middle school lunches got up and did a presentation, five minute overview. And at one point the presenter says, too often a meal in middle school is like a meal in prison. And I went up to her afterwards and I said, I really loved your presentation. I love the work you're doing. I have a bunch of kids. I get it. Um, but have you ever been inside a prison? She said, no, I've never been in a prison. And she said, well, I said, I just want you to know that the bad middle school lunch that you're comparing to a prison meal is probably better than most prison meals people are getting in prison. And in sort of looking into the, the answer to that question, I learned that nobody had really addressed the issue of food in prison, even though it touches the lives of every single person who's incarcerated. And that was really our jumping off point as a group that works on conditions of confinement, that thinks about the people who are inside and thinks about reform. But this is, this is something that needs to be addressed. And that's really what led to this work. Thank you. Well, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, project. It's really great to uh, hear about it. So uh, I, I just want to add one thing. You were talking sort of about jobs and who we work with. And I think an important part of this project. So I had mentioned that, you know, the women and the people who are formerly incarcerated who will get training, we're going to be working to place them into the vertical farm industry. And in part, that's because all employers, not just vertical farm employers, will say things like, we would love to hire people who are formerly incarcerated. We just don't know how, or we don't know where to find them. Or we don't know if we hire Alex in our company, that Alex will be the kind of employee that will show up on time, that can be trusted, that can handle the whatever it is, the work experience that we're going to provide. But if you, Impact Justice, through this project, can give us assurance that the people that we're going to hire, in a sense, have been vetted, have had experience in vertical farms, have the reliability that we're looking for, we will happily hire them. And so this really becomes a pathway to help other people get good paying jobs that have good benefits. Yeah, it sounds like you're giving people the chance to be involved in something very meaningful, but a very progressive form of work, which is not yeah. often the case for people in, in prison, is it? Yeah. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Are there any last things you'd like to say about the uh, project? Yeah, I mean, I know for for our company and organization, uh, it is it's truly an honor to be a part of such a transformative project. And I think just all of the the impacts uh, that this project will and and could have on the food system in prison. Um, and I think that uh, just with the spirit of that is is very inspiring in itself. So, um, yeah, that's those, those are my final words. Thank you very much. So uh, you're both clearly dedicated to the work 
that you do. But I would imagine that trying to reform the prison system, even in California, must seem pretty daunting at times. How do you keep yourselves going? Uh, I'm, I'm hardwired as an optimist, which is sometimes a benefit and sometimes makes everything harder. I also know that this is a long-term sort of epic struggle. This isn't something that's going to happen overnight and that it's a long road in front of us. I also see all of the time successes. You know, you know, changing a whole system is an overwhelming kind of idea. But changing lives, helping people, being part of transforming on a more individualized, human-to-human -human level, what might be possible, you can see those successes all the time. And it's those successes, those opportunities, that really are what sort of give me the fuel and the energy to continue to do this work. And I go back to, to that moment in that room uh, at CCFW with those women and just seeing their faces and their eyes and uh, just the change in their, their body language over the course of that conversation and just knowing the hope that they are uh, hanging on to. And I think, you know, as Alex said, I'm, I'm kind of hardwired to do things that just are difficult and haven't been done before, but that's how my mind just kind of works. And that's what gets me up out of bed every day of, of, of knowing that and knowing that we have this significant of an opportunity um, to, to enact change. And I, I think that's inspiring in itself. Uh, so, yeah. Beautifully put. Thanks very yeah. much indeed, the two of you. Yeah. And thank you for the work you do with this thank podcast, well. because for all of the work that George and I and others do, yeah. you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears about it, you know, did it happen? And I think that's true about this work. So thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed yeah. that conversation. Thanks very much. <laughs>